talk about wealth of knowledge. You, you bring it all together. Put the work in now to get yourself structured and organized and documented. We need to grow this top, top line. There is no one size fits all for this industry. Hey, Restorers, thanks for coming back to the Restoration Masterclass on Profitability. Today, we are talking about cash flow management and understanding your numbers, which is a big topic to pack into 15 minutes. But I have no doubt that Scott Miller, who is from the Growth League, can do it if anybody can do it. I've had the pleasure of um, chatting with Scott and having him on my podcast in the past, and he really understands how to work with restoration companies to increase your profitability, really understand your bottom line, your P&Ls, all of that. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So Scott, thank you very much for joining me. So go ahead and just kind thanks of introduce for yourself me. for people who have who are not familiar with you. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me again, Michelle. Always great to talk with you. Uh, so quick background. I got started in the industry in 2005. I was a franchisee with a national system. And then eight years later, I went through a process and bought my way out of the agreement, rebranded as an independent. And when I started about three years into it, I started coaching other uh, franchise owners. Mm -hmm. And I did that part-time the whole time I had my business. And then when I sold in 2017, started to do it much more full-time. Uh, so I've been helping restoration owners back since 2008, all sizes, anywhere from you know, startups to eight-figure restoration businesses. Uh, one of the things that I've continued to find there's this common thread of people not understanding their numbers. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, they, they kind of get scared and just uncomfortable, you know, just like anything, right? If you're not comfortable with it, you tend to shy away from it. Yeah, That's what happens a lot with owners and their numbers. So it's one of the things that I really focus on with new clients. So when you talk start. about, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no, God. When you talk about numbers, when you say the word numbers, what does that mean? What specifically yeah. are the numbers that they should be looking at? Yes. So what what I find a lot of times is people just look at the revenue, mm -hmm. right? So I talk to people all the time that have these big revenue numbers, but they come to me and they say, you know, I think I should be profitable or I think I should be more profitable. So the numbers that they're not looking at, a lot of times they're not, they're either not set up for job costing in their accounting system and their production management system, or they are in some cases, but aren't utilizing the data. So they're not, they don't understand the, uh, to back up, sometimes they don't even understand and communicate with their staff who are running jobs, what their profitability target should be. Yeah. So a lot of times it starts there. They don't even, they don't know what they're shooting for and they're their field staff doesn't know what they're shooting for. So what numbers are they not paying attention to? Setting a budget so that they have a labor and material budget. Um, they're not looking at their accrual PL, their cash PL. They're not looking at, in a lot of cases, their AR report. And sometimes they're looking at their AR report only when cash flow gets really tough. When they look at their bank balance and say, we need to collect some money. And and then sometimes they're not looking at their receivables report because they know it's not accurate. And, and that wow. can be another tangent, but that's all about their invoicing discipline. Yeah. You know, when, when are they invoicing? Some, some people invoice the job when they sign it. So sign a hundred thousand dollar contract, let's invoice it. So now it goes on the AR. It's not real. They don't know you yet because you haven't done any work. So, uh, there, there are different reasons that people are ignoring numbers. Some of it is they just, they don't know what they're looking at. Some of it is they know they could look at their numbers, but they don't, they can't rely on the accuracy of the numbers. Okay. What, <clears throat> what do you see some restoration companies doing really well when you go in? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we learn from our peers too. So I'm guessing yeah. that there are some companies that you've gone into where you're like, that's really smart. That's a really unique thing that you're doing. Do you have any examples there? Uh, I don't know so much about unique, unique but yeah, but, uh, some are really disciplined about a labor material budget. There can't be a job that starts until the manager or owner sees and approves the budget. So now they know 
there's a there's a good chance that this project is going to go well because the person running it knows exactly what the labor material budget is. And then they've got a process where each week, for example, they're just they're doing a review. How's mm-hmm. the job going so far? How are we doing with our draw schedule? So I think clients that are doing it really well have a discipline around a meeting rhythm so that they they're doing a good job of holding their team accountable. They're setting clear expectations, holding them accountable. And and then when the job closes, job uh, review at the end, you know, how did we do? Did we do as well as we plan to do based on the budget? So this, this regular discipline of meeting, setting expectations, holding the team accountable. From your experience, what is a healthy net profit or a, achievable net profit for a restoration company? Mm, that's It's a tough question right. because uh, different. So net profit, as you probably know, is related to cost of goods sold. So you've got revenue, less cost of goods sold, less expenses. A lot of times owners will run personal expenses through the business. Mm. Or not even that. So that that could be one element that affects net. The other thing that could affect net is you and I both have uh, an equal size business. You decide to take 100,000 through W-2 wages and I decide to take 30,000. Uh-huh. Right? Yep. So one of the things that comes up when you talk to brokers who sell businesses is this um, SDE, seller's discretionary earnings, or net benefit to owner, right? So it's it's a combination of the net profit of the business and add backs, um, yep. W two wages for the owner. So it's a tough tough question to answer. Okay, I, I think when you and this this could uh, this could cause some comments to show up if you're just mitigation and and you look at that that overall net benefit to owner. I think between, and it's a wide range, but between 20 and 30% net benefit to owner is reasonable to expect. And less than that in a full service business. Yep. Again, it's really tough. You could have you could have two $5 million revenue businesses where one of them is 50-50, mid and rebuild. And the other one is 80% rebuild, 20% uh, mitigation. And their nets are going to look very, very different. I'm sure. Yes. Okay. For owners listening to this thinking, I don't look at my numbers at all. And I don't know what they mean. Where do you even start? Especially so I can say for Mm -hmm. me, I come from a marketing background and I'm good with marketing and sales and those kind of things. Numbers for me are like, so that's been a big Mm -hmm. learning curve for me in my own business. So what do you recommend? Where do people start? Great question. So about a year and a half ago, I started with a new client. They reached out to me, referral, uh, somebody in the industry referred them to me. Second generation business. uh, He said, so we talked for a while. Sounds like very healthy business. So what would we work on if we decided to work together? He said, the numbers. She said, I'm embarrassed to say I don't look at P&Ls. I kind of do. I get them from my accountant once a quarter. And I glance to the bottom and kind of just see, do we make money or lose money? And that's about it. So the way we started with this person was, and this person's business, they were doing a really good job of collecting data, but nobody knew how to use it and nobody was using it. So the first step was I said, okay, well, on our first call, we planned for our first call. I want you to have QuickBooks installed on your desktop and we're going to start learning some basics. Yep. And I wanted to see what kind of data they were already collecting. And and it was great. You know, Within that first call, he was able to run a P&L on his own uh, for the company and then do one filtered by the job so you could see a job PL. And like the light bulb started going off for this guy. That was it was great. Fast forward a year and a half, they've got all kinds of new things in place where their project managers have gross profit targets. They are setting a labor and material budget before they've got draw schedules that they're they're following. Uh, they look at the job performance when it closes. 
and their profitability has has really gone up. And it's just they were already doing a lot of things right, but just the idea of actually paying attention to the numbers really made a difference. And also setting a budget. That's one thing that they weren't they weren't doing. What kind of like software technology should like do you see companies using for job costing? Are they using QuickBooks mm-hmm. for job costing or are yeah. there other tools that okay? So how simple yeah. is it for companies to get going like in QuickBooks to try to do job costing? It's pretty simple. You know, it it's one of those things that again, it's I think a lot of people have this um because they're not comfortable with it, they think it's harder than it is. When I started, I had no experience. I I was sales, marketing, um, no experience with numbers. And in the beginning, when I was on jobs by myself, literally by myself, I knew like, okay, I was calculating, okay, the exactimate, I was doing the exactimate in my head as I was riding the extractor or sucking sewage water. And I was calculating what my profit was going to be. So then I hired a couple of people and I was still on the jobs, managing the jobs, still easy to calculate in my head. So fast forward a couple of years into it, I realized I don't know what's going on from a number standpoint. And I decided I've, I've got to learn because I just, I can't, can't lay awake at night wondering what's going on. Mm-hmm. So uh, back to your question, it's not that hard. It really isn't. So you can do it completely in QuickBooks or all the big production management platforms uh, have the ability to set a budget and do job costing in there. And and a lot of, you'll be able to transfer it into QuickBooks automatically also. So the most restorers have the tools already. Most everybody has QuickBooks. Most everybody has some type of management platform industry specific. And even if you don't have that, if you just have QuickBooks, it's, it's easy to do. The, the harder part is the behavior part, getting people to clock in yeah. to specific jobs and clock out of specific jobs, uh, getting them to set a budget and mm-hmm. getting yourself, if you're their manager, if you're the owner and they report to you, getting yourself disciplined to review those things and hold those people accountable. It's That's the harder part. The technology part is pretty easy. Okay. Okay. And when it comes to cash flow, where do you see restorers kind of getting, you know, I guess in our industry, it's if you're not getting paid on a big job, you you could have a really big cash flow problem. So how can kind of this understanding your numbers, being able to look ahead as well, see what's coming down the pipeline, how can that help you keep your cash flow going? So maybe you're not relying on a line of credit so often or whatever, you're getting paid more quickly yeah. instead of dragging your feet through like arguing with adjusters or whatever that may be like mm-hmm. getting paid more timely. Yeah. So there's some element of this is, is kind of out of your control, but sure. there's a lot that that is within your control, right? You have mortgage yeah. company on the check. Some of it is out of your control, but I think Again, like coming back to being disciplined, making sure that your your AR is right so that you can count on and and know that it's exactly what you're owed. Um, having a draw schedule and meeting with your project managers or your production managers, whatever the title is in your company, and making sure that they are collecting mm-hmm. what's due to the company. And, and in some cases, it's not being afraid to tell the insured or your customer that you're going to have to stop work if you don't get the next draw schedule. Yep. Not letting yourself get behind. Um, It's, it's tough to do. There's all different types of scenarios with insurance companies, TPAs, mortgage companies uh, asking for advances, Mm -hmm. uh, something that a lot of times restorers don't do and can, Um, but really being on top communicating really well so that everybody understands what the draw schedule is and not being afraid to get the insured involved in calling the adjuster and saying, Hey, you've got to release more money, calling the mortgage company, getting them um, on your team, so to speak, in terms of collecting the money, Uh, having a get back to an AR that you can count on and that you can measure what your uh, there's this acronym DSO, Days of Sales Outstanding, measuring what your DSO is every month and maybe even incentivizing somebody who's in charge of collections 
to drive that number down, okay. make it somebody's priority, you know, let them own it. Because if, again, if, if the, the only strategy is let's collect money when things get really tight, it's not, not a great strategy. Having a written, having a documented process for your collections, you know, mm-hmm. your, how are you going to invoice? You know, how quickly I've seen clients and um, and just people that I know in the industry, when I ask them, what's your invoicing discipline like? Said, what do you mean? Well, when you finish a job, say a mitigation job, how long does it take you to get an invoice out? Some of them are you know, great right away. Mm-hmm. Day after we pick it up or the day that we pick it up. Others, it's when we get around to it, a couple weeks, maybe a week or two, or you know, when we get... We have a hard time getting information from the person that was supposed to scope it. And so when I hear that, that automatically adds a week or two yeah. to the time it takes you to collect money just because you don't have a disciplined routine for how you're going to invoice. I would think that also that that alleviates some urgency on the customer's part as well to pay as fast. Like if they're if you know, if you're sending it right away, they're like, I'm on it. I, this is top of mind. I know that this just happened, yeah. but if it's several weeks out, it's like, oh, well, they weren't in a hurry to send this to me. So I guess they're right. not ready for their money. Right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. yeah. Just having a sense of urgency, right? We as restorers have a sense of urgency when the phone rings and somebody says they've got uh, a cup of water that was spilled in the corner. We're, we're quick to get out there and take care of it right away. Be, be as urgent with collecting the money and invoicing. You'll sleep better at night. Won't be wondering Absolutely. if you're going to make payroll on Absolutely. Friday or whatever that may be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Again, that I- idea of sleeping better at night is what got me to decide I'm going to learn this mm-hmm. and and really understand it and put systems in place so that I don't have to worry about this all the time. Yeah. That is not, not an area that anybody uh-huh. wants to be in. No. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Scott. Well, anything else that you want to add to this before we wrap it up? Thank you for all your expertise. Yep. Uh, one thing. So performance-based compensation, once you have all the, these, the understanding and the reporting and you and your team can rely on the data, now you can put a performance-based compensation plan in place, which again, now that now you've got your team pulling for the same thing that you as the business owner are, are pulling for. Yeah. You, you want to do jobs really well, but you also want them to, to be profitable. Yes. So that's the other thing that becomes possible. Perfect. Well, thank yeah. you very much for all your expertise. Thank I you. appreciate it. Anybody who's listening to this, you can find more um, about Scott on the CNR website, which will also kick you over to his. Scott, thank you very much. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Thanks, Michelle. Take care.